Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you all for coming to CIS on a cold night. I'm Andrew Wilson, Ukrainian Studies here at UCL CIS. It's my pleasure to introduce a former student, uh, and this is his former PhD, largely, much <coughs> improved, no doubt. Um, uh, Jakob is here to talk about that research project uh, and uh, how it became a book. Uh, Russia's overlooked invasion, the causes of the two, 2014 outbreak of war in Ukraine's Donbass, just out with Ibidem Press, Ibidem Furlag. Um, so Jakob completed his PhD here in 2022. He previously studied international relations and contemporary European studies in Dresden, St. Petersburg, Bath and Siena. He has also worked as a Russian and Ukrainian media and current affairs analysis for the United States mission to the United Kingdom and as a researcher for forensic architecture. Um, he is also the editor of another collected volume, well, he is also the editor of a, another book, a collected volume called Civil War or Interstate War or Hybrid War, Dimensions and Interpretations of the Donbass conflict in 2014 to 2020. That's also Ibidem Verlag. Uh, lots of um, excellent articles by key experts on the subject. Do you want to mention Twitter? You, you want that advertised? <laughs> Twitter or account is on the, on the Twitter event. Twitter or X. <laughs> he is at Hauter Jakob. Um, over to you, uh, Jakob. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for the introduction. Um, so I would like to give a brief uh, overview over the key points I wanted to make with this book. Obviously, the key message of the book is that what happened in 2014 was already a Russian invasion and not a Ukrainian civil war. But let's dive into that a little bit deeper. To start with, just very few words on theory uh, and methodology. I argue that it's very important to keep the analysis focused uh, and prevent it from going off on tangents. Uh, that's why, why I develop an escalation sequence model for, uh, to define the key episodes that brought the Donbass in 2014 from a state of tense calm to uh, a state of war. Uh, and I also argue that we need to pay more attention to sources. Um, we shouldn't treat sources as affirmatory afterthoughts, but make them part of the narrative. And that's what I try to do with my focus on digital open source information. And I argue that we need to pay more attention to how we define causality and how we prioritize different necessary conditions. And here I follow the work of the historian uh, Clayton Roberts, and I argue that we should focus on the factor that is most disruptive to the normal course of events. But now enough of theory and methodology uh, and to my uh, empirical analysis of events in the Donbass. And here I would just like to highlight uh, five key points from the book. Firstly, my book argues that we get a pretty good idea of how things could have turned out in 2014 uh, if Russia had not taken the lead. And we get this idea by looking at what happened back then in uh, Mariupol. So let me read you a short passage uh, from chapter six. It is relatively simple to apply the Mariupol scenario to other locations in a counterfactual thought experiments. Attempt by separate, uh, attempts by separatist activists to occupy buildings and obtain arms lead to clashes with the military. The military withdraws. Local elites give up their tacit support for separatism and step up their engagement for public order. Separatist activity does not subside completely, but stagnates. Local authorities and separatist institutions coexist until the security forces regroup and eventually remove the separatists. So this is what happened in Mariupol. Could have happened elsewhere, but in reality, it only happened in Mariupol and in other places across the Dom Donbas, Russia did take the lead and things escalated further. 
And that leads me to my second point. Russia taking the lead didn't require the involvement of the regular armed forces initially. And it didn't even necessarily require a direct order from Putin. And to understand the nat nature of Russia's aggression, um, we have to acknowledge that the Russian state relies a lot on informal practices, on just letting certain people do their thing while imprisoning or killing others. And Igor Girkin's occupation of Slovyansk and Kramatorsk is a good case to illustrate this. And many people argue that Girkin can't, seen, can't be seen as a state agent because he acted on his own initiative. And he really wanted to go there. But I think this argument is flawed. And I'll read you a short passage from chapter 5 to explain why. So the coordination between the Russian state and Girkin's group, along with the Kremlin's obvious power to stop them, means that the Russian state's actions were more disruptive to the normal course of events than the personal motives of the group members. This line of, uh, this line of reasoning can be illustrated with the allegory of a robbery. If a person is robbed at gunpoint and a bystander fails to intervene, the actions of the robber should be considered the primary cause of the robbery. They are more disruptive to the normal cause of events than the passivity of the bystander. However, this assessment changes if the bystander and the robber had broken into a house together the day before, after which the bystander had given the robber a gun while talking about a personal grudge against the prospective robbery victim. The assessment changes even further if the robber calls the bystander to report on the progress of the robbery and returns to the bystander's house after the bystander pressures him to leave the crime scene. In such a scenario, there can be no doubt that the bystander's actions supersede the robber's actions as the primary cause that is most disruptive to the normal cause of events. And I don't think I have to explain who the bystander and the robber are in this uh, particular scenario. Um, yeah, um, and then to the third point. It is true that Russia depended on local support in the Donbass. But I would argue that this is of secondary importance. So let's look again at Igor Girkin and Slavyansk and Kramatorsk. Even though Girkin's group depended on local support, the abnormalism paradigm points to Girkin's actions as the primary condition for the occupation and the subsequent escalation of the conflict. In the context of the political situation in eastern Ukraine in April 2014, it is not surprising that there were some activists in Slovyansk Kramatorsk who were willing to support a Russian invasion. The arrival of heavily armed men from Russia with the determination and ability to lead an insurrection is far more disruptive to the normal course of events than the fact that some locals were willing to jump on these men's bandwagon. Now my fourth point. It, Girkim did play an important role, obviously, but it wasn't only him. There were many other separatist leaders with clear links to the Russian state. There were Igor Bezler, Alexander Baradai, Nikolai Kazitsin, and others. And you can read about them all in more detail in here. Um, but I would like to read you a short passage about Yevgeny Prigozhin and uh, the Wagner Group, much in the news last year and this year. But uh, I think yeah, the role in 2014 is uh, still very much underappreciated. At the end of September 2022, Yevgeny Prigozhin went a step further and explicitly admitted his own involvement in the creation of the, uh, of the Wagner Group, as well as the group's involvement in fighting at Luhansk Airport in 2014. And now I'm quoting Prigozhin, apologies for that. Um, I cleaned old weapons, sorted out bulletproof vests, and found specialists who could help me. From this moment, May the 1st, 2014, the group of patriots was born that subsequently acquired the name Battalion Tactical Group Wagner. Only because of their bravery and courage, it became possible to liberate Luhansk Airport and many other territories. And the fate of the Luhansk People's Republic and the Donetsk People's Republic changed dramatically. So here we have another case of uh, the Russian side actually openly admitting its involvement. Uh, just like Girkin in his many interviews, 
Prigozhin actually confirms virtually all Ukrainian's accusa uh, Ukrainian accusations against him. So finally, what does all of this mean for the current situation? And just to uh, finish off my brief remarks, I'll just uh, read you a short passage from the conclusion. This book has shown that the events of 2014 are aggravating rather than mitigating circumstances in any assessment of Russia's actions in 2022. The Russian regime's claim that it had to intervene after watching eight years of civil war is not only twisting, but completely inverting the truth. It is true that the war started in 2014 rather than 2022, but already back then it was Russia who started it. The invasion of 2022 is already Russia's second attempt to destroy Ukraine as an independent westward-looking state by military means. It was not a one-off overreaction that developed a life of its own, but part of a long-term agenda. This must be kept in mind when considering any kind of negotiations or agreements with Russia. It is key that Russian efforts to destroy Ukraine come to an end once and for all. Russia must never get a third opportunity to attack. Western weapons deliveries and Western training for Ukrainian soldiers are not an obstacle preventing negotiations. They are a prerequisite for any meaningful peace talks. Lasting peace cannot be based on trust and declarations of goodwill, but only on deterrence. Another deal like the Minsk agreements, which leaves Russia in control over Ukrainian territory, while it leaves Ukraine vulnerable to a new offensive some years down the line, is not an option. Ukraine must either receive security guarantees on par with NATO's collective security obligations, or it must be armed to an extent that prevents any decision maker in Moscow from even toying with the idea to finish what was started in 2014. This book has also shown that there's not even a shred of legitimacy to Moscow's claims of the territory of the so-called People's Republics in the Donbas. Discussions on the restoration of Ukraine's pre-war borders cannot refer to the territory controlled by Kiev on February 23, 2022. The Donetsk People's Republic and the Luhansk People's Republic are occupied by Russia, just like those areas of the Ukraine that the Russian military seized in 2022. Recognizing any Russian claim over these territories would mean recognizing a violent land grab. This does not necessarily mean that reconquering the whole of the Donbas by military means is feasible or advisable. However, this is a decision for the Ukrainian authorities and the Ukrainian military to make. After all the country has been through, it is not up to the West to tell Ukraine how much of its own territory it is allowed to liberate and what risks it is allowed to take. And on that note, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Back to you. you did a great job of... Uh summarising the main points of the argument uh, and slightly sidestepping the more technical points. If anybody has any questions about them, about OSINT and about uh, these key six critical junctures, um, I'm sure that can be covered in Q&A. Uh, thank you, Jacob. Before that, however, we have two uh, commentators. First, uh, Jade McGlynn, who is uh, Leverhulme Early Career Research Fellow at the Department of War Studies, KCL. Great department where my son studied. Okay. She's also a senior associate in the Europe program at CSIS and the author of two books, no less, in 2023. Both excellent. Russia's War and Memory Makers of the Politics of the Past in Putin's Russia. The first for Polity, the second for Bloomsbury. On Twitter, she is at Dr. Jade McGlynn. Thank Pens you. On Do we have to pose? Um, no, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> Don't. So the, oh, sorry. natural. We just get, get a pen from my suitcase, please. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh, okay. Well, thank you, first of all, um, Jakob, for inviting me and for dropping this off very kindly um, at Rusi um, <laughs> so that I could read it. It's funny because I just, I mean, not funny, haha, -ha, but I just came here from a meeting with um, a friend who works in the Ukrainian embassy and he was talking about the number of Russian soldiers currently around the sort of front lines, currently prepared um, for seemingly another round of, of offensives. And it's hard to think about anything 
but that but it also really brings home to me some of the points that I was already going to make about your book which is how necessary it is I mean there's lots of praise that I could give to your book and I will it's methodical it's well researched it's got both an innovative but also very tidy approach that I really liked you can follow it you know it's you can understand and I think it it breaks down a lot of a lot of things that have become mythologized over the years you know it, that's partly what I mean by necessary but also most importantly I think in the context of the horror that's going on it draws some pretty clear conclusions for how that is relevant to policy today by setting out this you know these are the nuances these are this is how we can see what was most likely or highly likely to use that that term that both our intelligence services and the Russian propagandists love so much. Um, but also, what does that mean for, for now? Because as you say, this is a war that started in 2014. And I suppose, again, to repurpose a Russian propaganda phrase, you know, where has everybody been for eight years or now nine years, sadly, getting on to 10? So on the methodological side, of course, there's an incredible amount there, and I think that this will probably be, um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if this has quite a strong influence on future PhDs, future sort of research degrees, because your approach to actually making OSINT something that can be applied academically um, and how methodical you've been in that um, is very interesting. And in fact, I've already stolen your critical <laughs> junctures <laughs> approach, admittedly, for a paper that's very much in work, but to look at memory wars and to look at the radicalization and escalation process there. So um, I am living proof of, of, <laughs> of, <laughs> of its usefulness. Um, but if we come back, I suppose, to the more, more to the empirical points, for me, I think chapter nine is. Um, is the, perhaps the chapter that made the biggest impression on me because it's talking about how um, the primary cause of the defeat in August 2014 um, is, of course, Russian large-scale intervention, I mean, large-scale comparative to what had gone before. And bluntly, that Ukraine, it raises the possibility that Ukraine could have restored, you know, not just some, but actually maybe quite significant parts of, of that area. But Russia didn't allow it. And I think this is important because it also points to something quite meaningful, which is why did Russia not allow that there, but it did allow it in Mariupol at that point? And why then did Russia want that territory? What was it planning to do with it? Because it didn't annex it, you know, for as we all know, for another eight years. Um, it quite clearly, I think, didn't worry about the people living there very much um, or at all. And so that then raises the question, what did they want? with that territory. Um, and I, I would be interested in hearing your much more methodical, I'm sure, answer to this. But I mean, to me, it points to the fact that they wanted to use Donbass or this sort of Derner, El Derner, as an instrument for controlling Ukraine. So this is ultimately always about, as you were just speaking about, making sure that Ukraine cannot fulfill its own sovereign wishes to develop as a country, whatever that might be. Um, and in some ways, reading this book, when I got to the end, I almost wished that there was a second volume that would then look at how that went on in terms of the, the escalation process between 2014 and 2022. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're in the market for writing of that, <laughs> maybe when you've had a rest, I'll definitely be <laughs> um, Tempting me here. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, if we stick to that point of, and I suppose part of the reason why I would be interested actually in reading that is because if we're talking about this idea that, okay, well, it didn't want to annex Donbass, mm. then it had a different role for, you know, what changed? At what point did it change? And there's a lot of discussion. There's been a lot written on this, but having read this book, I'm going mm. to wait to hear what you write, <laughs> what your argument is, because I think it would be an important intervention, much as, as this is, um, you know, to a discussion this academic discussion of civil war um, versus, you know, a Russian invasion, and you can add lots of kind of parenthetically lots of lots of adjectives there to help make it sound a bit different, but but broadly, that's the crux of the the issue. You come down very firmly on on one side, and 
well, it's not so much that I think you're right, I think you prove, <laughs> you prove <laughs> that you're right. Um, so in terms, in, in, in other sense, I suppose, in terms of the, the prehistory, if we will, to this invasion, um, I would be interested in hearing, perhaps when you have a chance to respond to the comments, a little bit more on what you think the role was of the, that period leading up to 2014. So if we talk about there being a sort of, that there is a sort of grassroots sentiment that, that was available or that was, you know, that manifests itself as separatism, you know, why is that? And of course, you know, this is too serious a discussion to get into, to, to start citing issues such as, oh, a general, you know, a, a general Ruskime vibe. Mm -hmm. But more, so I'm speaking more specifically about the Kremlin's role and different organizations, because it's not just the Kremlin, Russian Orthodox Church and the Ukrainian mm -hmm. Orthodox Church, Moscow Patriarch is, is now and, and more generally then, um, in in funding a lot of separatist mm -hmm. organizations, in particular regional organizations, so for example, like the Slobozhanshina mm -hmm. one in, in Kharkiv. And you do touch on this a bit, actually, um, already in terms of why it succeeds in some areas and not in others, but that's a question that I find fascinating. Um, in terms of you know why in Kharkiv was it up for mm -hmm. was that flag up the, the Kharkiv People's Republic up for a few hours, and why why is it still there? And you, I think you write quite rightly about the importance of having loyal sort of security um, services or you know loyal sort of law enforcement officers. But I also wonder if there's something in the laying of the groundwork and also what Russian. Um, curate, like handlers had to mm -hmm. work with in terms of disgruntlement um, and so on. Um, one aspect that I'd also like to hear a bit more um, in terms of, not in terms of the book, which where I think you handle it very delicately um, as it needs to be, um, but also very well, but in, in I'd like to hear more from you, I suppose, in your, in your response, um, would be to do with um, that genuine sentiment that was there of separatism in Donetsk and Luhansk. Um, and in particular, what happens perhaps with that now? Because having just come back uh, a few weeks ago from territories that were deoccupied in Kharkiv region and just into Donetsk region, a lot, each of the villages tended to have their own story actually of occupation. Um, but one of the predominant themes that came across was how cruel, how particularly cruel, and we're already starting from quite a high or a low bar, however you want to put it, the people from the Donetsk People's Republic were. Um, and you were speaking just then about whether or not it might be, and of course it's not my role as a Westerner to have any judgment on this, but just thinking in terms of, of sort of planning and what is feasible, you know, the idea of militarily retaking the Donbass, but also, you know, in what, Th th those bits that have been occupied since 2014, but also how how Ukraine is going to create a cohesive society with not just the attitudes that are there, um, you know, in, in Donetsk and have been obviously radicalized through lots of means, but also with the experiences of those who feel very strongly um, victimized and, and indeed were victimized, and that's a very soft way of putting it, um, by, by people from those areas. And so I'll, I'll wrap up there, but I just wanted to finally bring it back to the policy point, although in a way you sort of stole everything that I was going to say just then, because... Um, the emphasize. Yeah, I know, but it's... I mean, understanding how this was going to be and what were its key drivers, what, what is the causality sitting there and really starting to work out, I think it makes it abundantly clear, and I won't say very much because you've already said it, and because it is just so clear that any talk of the idea that, well, if we just give him this, then that will be fine. It's not about that. It's not about people. It's not about this particular part of territory. It's about you know a Russian vision of itself and Ukraine's role mm -hmm. in that um, in that vision in that geopolitical world. So it's about Ukraine, but it's also about Russia and about geopolitics. It goes much further than. Mm -hmm. Oh well, if we just give him, Mar if we let him keep Mariupol or the ruins of Mariupol, then that will be fine. And I think, um, you know, that's your. I think the way that you've laid it out makes shows up the absurdity of that position. 
um, because there's really no factual basis. And that's important because often sometimes it feels as if those who um, are for negotiations or say, oh, we need to find some kind of compromise. Of course, they're not compromising their own land, they're compromising mm -hmm. Ukraine's, but they often present themselves as kind of the adults in the room. Mm -hmm. Um, as if, well, we've all got to be realists, but it's not real. It's not realist, or not in any kind of meaningful sense of, of the English word. And then finally, in terms of future research, one of the things that I thought was very interesting was, well, I've already asked you to write another book, but in terms of <laughs> other <laughs> research, one of the things that I thought was so interesting was the kind of the spectres sort of just forming, you know, with, you have Wagner um, mm -hmm. popping up, you have different sort of figures who then um, come back again, either in Africa mm -hmm. or in Syria or, or later on. And I've just finished a report looking at Russian <coughs> propaganda in the occupied territories. And what's so interesting is you have all of these figures just come back and they've kind of, they've normally been in Tiraspol or Belgorod or somewhere completely mm -hmm. random. Sometimes Odessa, but mainly Tiraspol, or Belgorod, or, or somewhere like this. Yeah, and then they just, and then they've just reappeared. And it, I think it would be so fascinating to know what, where have they been for the last eight years? You know, what were they up to mm. in that time? Um, were they working with intelligence services? Were they just doing nothing? You know, what, what was going on? It, I think it would be interesting to to track them and see. Um, but yeah, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jade. Thanks, Jade. We'll hear from Yaroslava in a minute. And there's some pretty big questions there. Yeah. But the uh, organisational yeah, yeah. deal was that Jakob would try some initial responses to Jade's comments. Yeah, uh, just briefly, we can expand on it uh, later. Uh, thank you very much for these comments and for the uh, <laughs> yeah high praise for my book. <laughs> thank you very much. That was very uh, pleased to hear. Um, yeah, and excellent, excellent questions, and definitely uh, yeah, makes me thinking about what uh, about what I would like to do <laughs> <laughs> research next, maybe. And yeah, I think the question, yeah, what did Russia want with the territory? That's that's really key. And I was um, at the time, I before the full-scale invasion, I was probably yeah inclined to be, to side with those people who said that Russia actually yeah, doesn't. Yeah, as you said, doesn't care about the Donbas itself very much, and mainly sees it as a tool to keep their foot in the door in Ukraine. I could even, I think it's even plausible this, you know, this idea that they were hoping for some kind of settlement, giving somehow the uh, reintegration settlement, giving the giving the DNR and the leadership some sort of veto power, um, which is yeah, an absurd idea if you think about like having someone like. And back then, Alexander the Harchenko was sitting in Kiev and they're saying no to things. Like, but that's I, I could imagine that some people had this kind of idea. Then maybe not the Harchenko, but someone else. But that Why? yeah, that they had Bosnia. Not Bosnia, basically. Mm. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So then, but that still leaves the key question. Then yeah, what what changed? And it also I, I touched on it briefly in the conclusion. In a way, um, you could argue already that in 2014, already what Russia did in 2014 was irrational. That somehow it would have been much more. But even taking the devil's advocate perspective, that it would have been more promising to just, you know, let the Maidan, let the dust settle on the Maidan, let the inevitable dis uh, disillusionment with the new authorities kick in, and then start a new, sort of more like sort of soft power kind of, kind of Medvedchuk kind of style project, um, you know, without antagonizing lots of people by launching a war um, and rather yeah, trying to undermine Ukraine in, in another way. But Russia didn't do that. Russia went went for a military, for a military solution and then, or non-solution, but for, <coughs> went down this invasion path. And then they doubled down in 2022, which I was also one of those people who was reasonably calm about it until two weeks before it happened, because I just thought, you know, this is crazy. They, like, nobody can honestly think that this is a good idea. but. They did, and um, yeah. So I think this is really something, yeah, something uh, worth looking into further. This kind of what, yeah, what changed, and what were the motives? Uh, what, yeah, what what triggered these? I mean, we kind of we can we can uh, kind of explain it. You know, that lots of people have ex tried to explain what Russia did, what it did. But then, yeah, why why then and not before? Why didn't they go on to Mariupol in 2014 and then decided to do it in 2022? That's yeah, very important questions. Um, about the period before 2014, um, 
it, it somehow my, my feeling is that it, it it strikes me as a rather sort of half-hearted attempt to, you know, if you look at, at these people who took tried to take the lead early on and the, uh, it, it, quite strange figures somehow who had been around for quite some time and who were kind of you kind of say was in a way they were doomed to fail because they weren't really they were just too marginal somehow so my and at the same time as long as you know, under Yanukovych there wasn't really much you know having basically Donetsk in charge in Kiev there, there wasn't really that much need to stoke separatism but there were some I think these a lot of these people who then stirred up some trouble in 2014 they already started appearing after the Orange Revolution. So I think it was already be already back then, at least some players in Russia decided to, yeah, let's, yeah, let's maybe throw some money at people, let's try to support some people, and let's see what, what they can do. Let's just, yeah, let's, let's try some, maybe there were even competing projects. You know, a lot of this, probably a lot of this informality that I mm -hmm. talk about was happening then as well, but I don't really, s I, I think 2014 shows that that wasn't a super high priority and that didn't, go particularly well just because yeah, separatism was so yeah, it seemed relatively poorly organized initially and then until people like Irkin came in. Uh, finally, um, yeah, oh, in Kharkiv and Donetsk comparison, I think there are quite a few good studies on that. Unfortunately, a few of them then so draw the talk more about civil war uh, or view, view things more through the civil war prism, but still there are some, I think there are some interesting takeaways there on just the yeah the, how the Ukrainian institutions were stronger in Kharkiv how this separatist groups were even weaker than they were in Donetsk um, but I would say the key it's, it's just when you draw these comparisons it's just easy to for uh, you just have to be careful not to forget that what what I would say in the book that Donetsk would have failed as well if it hadn't been for Gherkin and people uh, and Baradai and people like him it would have may maybe taken a bit longer than Kharkiv, but it still would have, I would say. So, and yeah, and then separatist sentiment. I think there were some interesting opinion polls in March, April 2014. I don't think necessarily that they, but I would say, that, okay, they are, it's always the question how trustworthy are opinion polls, especially in that kind of environment. But I think it's they seem kind of plausible with the, yeah, it's, I would say a sizable minority, supporting some vague idea of Mother Russia or, like, or mm -hmm. some having some kind of sympathies for well, the, the, the Russian world. Um, I think that is entirely plausible. But then again, it's a bit like, I don't think a lot of people were really aware of what that would entail, especially you know, in terms of both like war and repression and all, all these things. And they had been fed a lot of Russian TV already in the years before that. So that's also something to take into account but I think yeah it's it shouldn't be uh, local sentiment shouldn't be dismissed and also it will be yeah I think it it, it would be it would be a huge challenge to reintegrate these territories now especially with everything that's happened in the meantime and, and with a lot of people from there actively participating in the atrocities committed in 2022 2023 and that will be yeah that'll be a even if the, you know, the, let's say Ukraine restores control of all its territory, it's a massive task in terms of uh, yeah, restorative justice, in terms of you know, questions like who to prosecute, who to what kind of who to give amnesty, and these kinds of things, and then and then to win people over to the to Ukraine again. So yeah, um, big big challenges definitely. Uh, I'll leave it at that. And uh, yeah, thanks, Jakob. Um, that sizable minority was famously measured in uh, March, April 2014 at just under 30% favouring some kind of political union with Russia, which is <coughs> the same thing as separatism, actually. But that included both strong supporters of that statement and moderate. Um, so strong supporters, only about 10%. Um, Yaroslava Barbieri is our second commentator. She's a researcher at the Department of Political Science and International Studies at Birmingham. She recently published an article based on her doctoral study, Raising Citizens, <coughs> excuse me, Citizen Soldiers in Donbass, Russia's Role in Promoting Patriotic Education Programs in the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. She is also a researcher at the ARENA program at John Hopkins 
dedicated to creating best practices for overcoming disinformation and polarization. Her commentary has appeared in national and international media outlets. Uh, Yara Barbieri on X. Yara, Thank you very much for having me. Um, I have to say that many of the points that I'd like to make will resonate with many uh, with much that has already been said, which I think is actually um, um, a good thing because it means that you know the positive thing that uh, Jade has already highlighted. You know, I had the same experience. So, um, of course, if you already had the chance to read the book, you'll notice that um, it's not just methodologically rigorous, it's also methodologically innovative. So, as you state in your introduction, you talk about how there are no other academic studies that really rely and combine um, uh, digital open uh, source information with process tracing. And so, that's not just extremely relevant for the Ukrainian context in terms of challenging the extremely harmful frame of civil war that has a massive impact also in how it's coded in quantitative study. You mentioned some of the most um, influential databases such as the Uppsala conflict data program and I went to actually see how they frame it and you see that um, the page dedicated to the conflict in Ukraine, they say that um, Russia's 2022 invasion terminated the 2014 intrastate conflict over Novorossiya. Like this one line overlooks a whole set of nuances that actually requires an area study specialism. But of course, that's the you know endless debate between qual and quant um, researchers. So I won't go there. Uh, but that's just the one small example that really highlights the importance of dissecting these on the ground processes uh, dating back to 2014, if not earlier, to understand what happened in 2022. And of course, also beyond the Ukrainian context, because uh, we realize that we're sitting on this mountain of online data. And of course, the big challenge is understanding how can we capitalize on it, but at the same time, navigating the challenges of this information and now AI generated propaganda. So, uh, but it's definitely a challenge for the next this generation, the next generation of researchers. How can you utilize all of this data available there um, online? And of course, um, something that I really appreciated about the empir your empirical analysis is that while being so rich in terms of uh, mapping out, tracing. Um, systematic role of Russian state and non-state actors of the Russian determinant role in escalating the war in 2014, you avoid the trap of thinking that Russia operated under this um, you know, master plan. Um, and, and that's actually a conclusion I draw in my PhD. You, you actually see that when you dissect these on the ground processes, you see that actually they operate in a very ad hoc manner. Um, so as, as an example, um, that's something I'll go back to uh, a bit later, but um, you see that in the first years, uh, Russia operated in a very ad hoc manner because it was exactly instrumentalizing the occupied areas you know, as an instrument of pressure on Ukraine. But it's only when Ukraine imposed the uh, economic blockade in early 2017 that Russia started um, really pushing systematic steps for integration of local security, military, economic, educational structures into Russian federal structures. So I was very pleased when um, Jade said that she'd like to see a volume two of Yakut's book. And I have to admit that when I was reading it, it felt like your PhD and my PhD are both volume one and volume two, because what you do, you're zooming in on those first stages in 2014, which I sort of skim over, or because what I do, I look at Russia's the involvement of Russian state and non-state actors from late in 2014 until 2022. Um, and so I really, really appreciate that effort to dissect these on the ground processes because they just, exp like you have to get that your hands dirty to really understand that incredibly, complex um, network of interests and actors, and that's really when it exposes that Russia really was exploiting um, different situations when, when, when it understood it, it suited its interests. Um, so I thought that was a very um, important contribution. So when thinking about, um, you know, 
further um, areas of research, uh, potential additions to the excellent analysis that you've already done, um, sort of echoing what um, Jay had already said, I thought it would have been useful to have a background section that sort of looks also at Russia's effort to, you know, set the preconditions for violent conflict because exactly the events of 2014 did not happen in a vacuum. There have been lots of um, effort in, um, uh, you know, you mentioned already the Orange Revolution being quite a turning point. Um, you know, the whole frame of Ukrainian in Kiev being fascist uh, is really a narrative that started coming out. Um, around 2004 with these documentary films, you know, portraying, for example, pre former President Yushchenko's American wife as, you know, a CIA agent. So all of those narratives actually uh, date back uh, quite some time. Um, and so I think it just would have been useful because um, to, to introduce the reader, actually, that there have been things that have been happening um, you know, for a while, you know, the Severodonetsk uh, rallies that really were trying to gather local councillors from the southern and eastern regions, 2004 and 2008, and guess what? Who would come to these rallies? You know, former mayor of Moscow, Zatulin, so very kind of influential uh, member of the State Duma that is always involved in these issues around relations with um, um, compatriots, as they call them. Um, and has been pushing quite um, nationalistic narratives. Um, and interestingly, he's also the head of the Institute for CIS countries. Um, and Moldova and Ukraine have a separate department. Uh, so it, just to highlight the um, salience of these countries um, um, for, for you know, Russia's security interests. Um, and in thinking, you know, and you even read the memoirs of the last KGB director, Bakatin, and, you know, when thinking about the origins of potential separatist sentiment in, in, in Donbass, you see that, you know, actual organizations that actively, you know, took this stance, such as Interfront, uh, Intervigenia, and he writes, we, the KGB, set up these organizations um, in Transnistria as well, so they're not even hiding, it's just that you need to get your hands dirty in really extracting all of this data from memoir, from online um, sources. So um, I think it's, it's just extremely interesting and policy relevant to really look at the uh, evolution really since at least 1991. And linked to that, when I was um, reading your quite rightful reflection on the fact that when you use process tracing, you can't really go back to you know, the, the medieval times, you have to have like a stopping point to actually make sure that it's still efficient and, and relevant. Um, uh, this, you know, you cannot have this um, infinite regress, uh, regress in the past, but it, it was quite interesting to think about it in the contents of contemporary efforts to actually uh, rethink this as a anti-imperial war. So you have some interviews with Ukrainian soldiers that say this war did not start in 2022, it did not start in 2014. We've been fighting this for 350 years. Uh, so it's going back to you know 17th century when it's it's basically kicked off. Um, you know Russia's really strong influence um, on Ukraine. Um, so just I was wondering, you know, how whether you had these reflections whilst writing your PhD and the book, you know. Um, how you need to sort of retrace back the process, but whether you sort of, uh, you know, were fighting, I don't know, maybe the temptation of, of looking a bit further back, whether it's something you might be interested in doing um, um, in the future. And also, I was hoping to hear a bit more um, your thoughts about the implications of your own observation that Russia really operates in an ad hoc manner, uh, rather than following a master plan. Another way of putting it for me is that it's, it's largely that the war in the bus is a really a story of miscalculations from all sides. Russia miscalculated because it thought that Ukraine would fall in 2014. It uh, you know, overestimated the impact that the Minsk agreements could have, and it thought that Ukraine would fall again in 2022. Or the local network of warlords um, and occupying administrations, some of them are actually ideologically committed, were committed to this idea of Novorossiya, um, and you know, 
look at the fate of some of them, that is uh, infamous uh, still calls. Um, but you know, they ended up being exploited for Russia's interest um, at different stages. And even Ukraine, sadly, it was facing a you know impossible dilemma. Dilemma: them if you do, them if you don't. So uh, when the war started, of course, on the one hand, it's about um, avoiding direct engagement to you know avoid any risk of legitimizing politically these uh, you know illegal entities of DNR LNR but at the same time isolating them incurred the risk of Russia exploiting this and sort of you know incorporating them further which is exactly what happened and so this is what I do in my PhD I, I look at these critical junctures in 2017 you see that they start really you know installing these um, institutes such as the Russians on Vast Integration Committee, and you've got these Russian Crimea uh, uh, policymakers that really, you know, lead this process. And you see that it's essentially um, it created this. I call it the reintegration paradox, because exactly as you pointed out, the context of the Minsk agreements was trying to force the reintegration of these regions as an instrument of pressure to sort of destabilize, undermine Ukrainian statehood from within. But the more these processes of integration were pushed forward, the more they paradoxically undermined the original objective because they were becoming virtual Russian uh, regions. So how can you really reintegrate regions that are you know, fully integrated into Russia's federal structures? Um, and so again, to echo some of the points that um, Jay was saying, when it comes to really understand the policy relevance of your excellent analysis for nowadays, when you emphasize how it's important to understand the events of 2014 as a prelude of the events of 2022, why it's, it's relevant for today, because it directly impacts ongoing discussions around war reparations and post-war reconciliation, because if it's about calculating the damage that Russia has done, it's not calculating how much damage it's done since 2022, but back to 2014. And again, even more challenging is, of course, what Jade was um, referring to when thinking about, um, you know, post-war reconciliation. Because whether Ukraine regains these territories through military means or diplomatic means, the reality is that the situation of people that have been under occupation since 2022 is really different from people that have been under occupation. Children, think about children, 2014, and that article that. Um, Andrew mentioned specifically um, looks at indoctrination program um, on the ground, and interestingly, and that links directly closely to Jay's area of, of expertise. Uh, but I mentioned how you know exactly to say Russia, you know, operated in a dark manner. But the one thing that they did systematically from the beginning in the occupied areas of Donbass was the indoctrination program, and they copy pasted legislation from Russian legislation. Um, and even more interestingly, um, you emphasize how, you know, rightly so, everyone um, stressed the incredible resilience of Ukrainian civil society, but also state structures in 2022 to withstand Russia's invasion in those first months before Western armaments started coming in. Uh, but also remembering that 2014 was not really a failed state. It's not an, an, an inter you know, an um, ethnic civil war. Uh, but it's thinking about continuation of that resistance since, since 2014. So I think it's interesting in terms of future areas of research. What is it about, you know, Ukrainian statehood that made it resilient? You know, these different chapters of resilience. So I really enjoyed um, that point. Yeah. So just to conclude, I mean, as I mentioned, it really felt like volume one, volume two. So I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, uh, reading your, your book, and um, I think that the bottom line is that the insufficient attention given over these years to those on the ground processes, I think, um, is deeply responsible for uh, Western policymakers, researchers, um, um, you know, the fact that they underestimated the Kremlin's appetite for actually radically revise their original strategy of subversion through the Minsk process, abandoning it and deciding to uh, resort to the much higher risk option of um, a full scale invasion. So, again, it's, um, you know, appreciating the research of someone that actually wanted to dissect those processes and, and, and help us understand better how we got here.
Thank you very much. Jakob. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we are very glad to hear that uh, more research sort of blends into uh, each other nicely. I'm very much looking forward to reading your book, to reading uh, <laughs> volume two. Um, yeah, two very interesting questions. Uh, yeah, the, you're right, definitely the so Russia's more lo long-term efforts to stoke separatism in Ukraine would be uh, worth researching further. Um, I guess probably the reason why I, I didn't do it in this book was that it, I felt it would, well, there's only, always only so much you can do with it in a PhD, right? And I felt this is sort of, as the final argument turned out to be that in 2014, it was mainly sort of the Russian external influence. Um, I thought it wouldn't be sort of the most productive way to dwell too much then on the on the way that Russia tried to um, yeah, on, on Russia's links to the internal dimension, right? Since since all this, I argue, you know, all this these years and years of trying to undermine Ukraine from within actually didn't turn out to be that effective because in the end they still needed to send in the troops to make it work. Um, so yeah, that's why uh, <laughs> to make it work in a, yeah, uh, in, a, in a small part of the, uh, of the country. Yeah. Um, yeah, because that was the case. I thought I, yeah, I, I could cut that out and didn't need to dwell too much on the, yeah, Russia's, the, the connections then between these yeah, pro-separatist groups in Eastern Ukraine and uh, Russia, but definitely, I, I would say, yeah, d definitely worth looking into further. We can say, okay, now you know that we have established that. Yeah, okay, it was primarily Russia in 2014, but of course, it is still worth looking more into the, yeah, more the the long-term agenda there. And also in relation to your second question, which I think is really uh, extremely important, this, um, yeah, the, the the implications of this ad hoc decision making, because it's a weird. There's both there, right? There is a lot of ad hoc, spontaneous stuff, but but also the overarching uh, aim to destroy Ukraine, essentially. So there is we've got consistency on the one hand and for ad hoc decision making on, on the other, and it's it's sort of, it's a fine yeah fine line basically be, be, between the two. I think a lot of the sort of civil war literature also sort of claims that Russia. I didn't really know what's going on, wasn't really in control of things, and I would take issue with that. I think there was a lot of, there was a lot of ad hoc decision making, a lot of sp spontaneous reactions, but that was kind of Russia's way of trying to, uh, of staying in control of the situation, of reacting to, um, yeah, essentially of of pushing things that in in the direction they they wanted. So it's a yeah, it's an interesting mix of um, of consistency and unpredictability, right? And that uh, and that is something that I think we need to, to research further. Something that again relates to what I said. I, I would be interested in looking into further this. Why? What changed? Why did? Why did the Russian? Okay, we know the Russian leadership wants to destroy Ukraine, but why did they use? Why did they use one particular tool at one point and another tool at the other? Um, yeah. So we. Need, to do more research on that, and also it's something yeah, extremely important for policymakers. Also, in terms of what the question of what is Russia Russia going to do next, um, I think I think one thing that is clear is that you need clear that you need to be very clear in your messaging. Or you need um, and that because there is a lot of we know the ad hoc decision making happens. We know seemingly irrational decisions are made and implemented. Um, so and. That means that it's, it's important to leave as little room for miscalculations as possible. Like this, you know, this whole idea that the you know, the idea that the West won't stand up for Ukraine, the idea that yeah, yeah Ukraine will crumble at the, at the moment we we'll send we send in the tanks. Like this, uh, it yeah, it was. I think a key reason for Russia acting the way it did was that this kind of this kind of impression could emerge in Moscow. I like guess always a question to what extent Western policymakers can can prevent that, right? Or can, but at least that that has to be, at least we have to try. It has to be taken, yeah, into account that, uh, yeah, any kind of, yeah, the, the the Russian leadership might draw the wrong conclusions from certain types of, yeah, vague or 
timid, or what, what we would see as sort of very, uh, we would uh, we would interpret as very sort of measured and cautious reasoning and uh, and debate could be interpreted as essentially yeah, unwillingness uh, or lack of resolve. I think that's always something that has to be kept in mind. Definitely, it's, it's one of the major mistakes, right? We kept on going on with the same mistakes that don't provoke Russia, don't provoke Russia, and that was just seen as, you know, seen as a weakness, and, and this was a major miscalculation.